Welcome to the Tied Together podcast, where we feature everyday people doing extraordinary things. Be sure to like, subscribe, and share so others can join in on the conversation too. Today's guest took passion and talent and merged them into business. She's rubbed elbows and hosted interviews with elite artists like Monifa and Wyclef Jean been front row at the VMA red carpet and invited to speak at women's leadership summits to spread her wealth of knowledge in business and marketing. Just like every good album has an intro, Tony started her journey pursuing a degree in media and marketing communications and landed an internship at Jive Records. Today, she is the owner of her own digital media marketing and public relations firm, Boar Media. Please welcome Ms. Antoinette Warren. Hi, hello. Good, good. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for being on today. Thank you so much for the invitation. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. So take me back to college, your college days. What were your dreams and goals back then? When I started college, to be very honest with you, I didn't really have a concrete vision. I knew that I wanted to go in business, but I didn't really know. And I had, I did have this concept of maybe I'll do marketing, right? But I think I, when I first started Baruch, um, I was doing like a general business degree and then uh, you have to take your core classes and then you decide if you're going to go into accounting or you're going to go into other specifications. And I did have that mindset that I would do marketing because even from high school, I, I heard about marketing and I was like, I think that's something that I could be good at. But I didn't really know exactly what it entailed specifically. Um, so, but I, I didn't love college. I just thought that, and it's probably more meaningful today. I thought college is a business. I think that college is an, is an essential part of your career growth if you want to climb the corporate ladder. Mm-hmm. Um, but in my mind, I never thought that college gave you necessity. Necess- necessarily the tools to be successful Mm. right and I told I remember telling a professor that yeah college is a business y'all make money at this you know it doesn't mean that I'm going to be successful in life I know that it's necessary to have like on paper it looks good that I've been to college but I wasn't sold the dream simply from going to college Mm -hmm. so that was my whole philosophy I did good I, I, I always been like a good student And it wasn't until like maybe my sophomore year that I was like, I started really going specifically more into media, going to marketing classes. Um, And instead of pursuing the full business degree in marketing specifically, I did the liberal arts route. It was like an ad hoc program, like combined media communications and marketing. So I kind of curated my own degree. There was a program to do that. So that's kind of how it started. I did like three internships, like you mentioned, Jive Records, and I did one at a public relations firm. Mm-hmm. And I also did one at Zomba Label Group. Dope. Oh, sorry. Zomba Label Group is under Jive, but I did one at VP Records is what I'm trying to say. The reggae, yes. you know, because I'm Caribbean or whatever. So that was a great opportunity. So that's just kind of how it started. It had a general knowledge, had no specific direction, but some kind of idea of where I wanted to go. What interested you in marketing in high school? What about that field did you like? I believe I took a business class Mm -hmm. in high school and they talked about um, marketing, like just general overview of marketing. And I think that that was just what piqued my interest. I was good at the, I was was doing really well in the class. I knew I did not want to do any health careers, go into the health field because that was what Hillcrest was all about. Right. And my mom was in the health fields. My sister was in health. And it was just kind of like going to health because it's a secure career path. I don't like hospitals. I don't like going, walking into hospitals. If I never have to walk into a hospital ever again, I don't care. Um, And so I knew I wasn't going to do that. So I was like, I'm going into, I'm going to go to a business program. And it it was just that inkling of, oh, maybe marketing. Again, Mm -hmm. never really any specific direction of, what that would look like. Right, right, right. So once you decided that you did want to be in the marketing field and this is early into you getting out of college, you know, what was the your joy at that point? Well, I was always good at writing um, 
any kind of content. Like it really started when I was a kid, one of my, my, my childhood best friend and I would, I would, I never used to go outside because my parents were not one of those parents that you could just go outside and play all day. They were like, you go to school, you come home. And so both of us coming from Caribbean backgrounds, we would always be on the phone and then we would like make up stories. Okay. And we would talk about like who was our crush, like which artist was our crush. I had a crush on Nas when I was younger. <laughs> Who didn't? <laughs> right. <laughs> I would like write stories. I would make up scenarios about who's my boyfriend. I was gonna get married. So I knew really early on. I didn't think I didn't think of it as a talent. Mm-hmm. I knew early on that I, I I could just make up stories. It was natural for me. And in marketing, marketing is about storytelling. Marketing is about it's also um, psychology, right? It's how the human mind works. It's how you convince people to buy into a product slash service or both. And so I think marketing appealed to me because of the storytelling part of it, like the communications part of it. And I just thought that, okay, maybe that was something I could go into because that was easy for me. Right. And then it was like other people telling me like, you have a personality, like you have a very social personality. To be very honest with you, I, I don't think that's true. I mean, it's funny to me because I do come alive in certain scenarios or certain events, but in my everyday life, I disconnect Mm -hmm. from a lot of social stuff because I like to to zen. I like to get into my vibe. I like to listen to music. Therapy for me is going on a long walk. Mm -hmm. Nobody, like, just leave me alone. Let me just zone out. So it it was other people kind of saying, you know, you have that part of personality. Maybe you can get into some kind of industry where you, you're, you're client facing. Right. And that was just kind of it. Like, again, no, no real direction. That's funny. Um, you know, a lot of times people can be good at putting on confidence or putting on that bright light, but that's, yeah. that doesn't feel like who they are. Um, I like to refer to myself as the antisocial socialite. <laughs> yeah, I like the way that you said that. Yeah. yeah, because I can turn it on. I mean, I was in sales for eight years. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, managed the sales team, yeah. went out, sold cars, but really and truly, I do like time to myself. Right. You know, I like to be alone. I like to read, uh, write things to, that I do alone. But you're like you, able to turn it on when it's necessary, and people saw that in you. And I love how you had these inklings from a child, you know, the writing, um, being so social, even though you didn't know it, (laughs) just kind of liking marketing and then not even realizing that this was going to take you on your career path moving forward. So I really think that's dope. So you were mentioning, mentioning the writing and that being your first love. So you were writing a blog, you still write a blog, isn't that right? I do. I do. So to, to go even one step further than that, mm-hmm. the reason why writing became important, I, sh- as, an, you know, as a young kid, I actually struggled with reading. Oh, I didn't A know lot that. of people don't know that about me. Like, no. I, I came from Jamaica. I was seven, eight years old. Mm-hmm. And, but in Jamaica, I, I, I was not like a really, really good student because I struggled with reading comprehension. Mm. And there was no one around me to really nurture that and really like sit me down and help me mm-hmm. with my reading comprehension. So it wasn't until, you know, my sister and I moved to the United States, New York City specifically, in Queens, New York. I was like seven and eight, seven slash eight. And I got by just by, by just being well behaved. Mm. It wasn't until the fourth grade. So I, they put me back a year, second grade, which is usually standard practice when you come from another country. Mm-hmm. They put me back a year, second grade, repeated second grade, got to third grade, got by on good behavior. It wasn't until the fourth grade that I remember this woman, I would never forget Miss Gonish. She was not having it. She would not, and it was just, it wasn't just me, it was all of us. We were in a class where we went through two teachers prior to her because we were not well behaved. But I won't say I was not well behaved. My yeah. class, Overall, we were just a little rough around the edges. And we went to, through two, we went through a teacher. She had a panic attack. She never came back. The substitute was was just like, I'm done with y'all. So Ms. Gonish was the history teacher. And she would walk around classrooms. But then they assigned her to us specifically. And she was like, oh, y'all think y'all gonna get over, okay? <laughs> she wasn't having it. She would sit us down. 
Y'all not going to recess. You're going to stay here at lunch. You're going to read. You're going to read out loud. If it wasn't for that woman, she called, she would call your parents out. She's having trouble reading. Sit her down and make her read out loud. And it was, if it wasn't for her, I would don't know where I'd be today. Mm. Because had she not done that, my father wouldn't have done that. Probably sat me down. I mean, even though he probably wasn't the best teacher because he had no patience. <laughs> but again, if it, she hadn't done that, I probably would not have learned how to read and appreciate reading, appreciate language, and then appreciate storytelling. Mm. So that was really also what made me go into writing and stuff because I didn't learn how to know how to read until a very long time. Wow. I wouldn't have known that about you at all. You don't know that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Because when I think we went to school in middle school together. Yeah. Yeah. And you were a smart kid as far as I knew. I was in like some top classes. Mm -hmm. It didn't start out all the time. It was in fourth grade. Because of her, I got into the top fifth grade class Mm -hmm. so well. And then fifth, Sixth, seventh, eighth, I, it just went on from there. Mm-hmm. And I started in the fourth grade. So it's never too late to get your no. kid on board. No. And I'm sure that people watching that are like you that either struggled with reading in the past or struggled with reading now. Mm-hmm. And um, obviously didn't know this topic would come up. But if they are struggling with reading now, what would you say is a, a good way to go about things to, to get better at reading comprehension or just reading in general? You have to read out loud. Mm. You have to hear yourself speak and pronounce the words. And I think that helps maybe with articulation as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I know audio books right now is probably even more helpful with that. But you literally have to sit down and read out loud and get comfortable with looking stupid. Because I guess in people's mind, you got this ego. Mm. And you prevent yourself from getting better at things because you don't want to look foolish especially if you're older you're you're that that conf that complex and Mm -hmm. you have an image to uphold right but I think reading out loud is an excellent way to combat your reading challenges listening to audio books and hear how things should be said or the proper pronunciation of words could definitely help with that That and you can do that in private I was going to ask you, do you suggest like alone or in front of people? I think you should start out in private. And then as you become more comfortable, maybe somebody that's closest to you, mm-hmm. that's not judgy or right. like, very understanding, compassionate, you can probably pull them in and ask them like, help me or confide in them. Like, you know, I've struggled, but I'm, do you mind letting me read out loud for you to hear me? And if I have challenge, you can help me correct that. But that was ex- what did it for me. And yeah. I was, I was, what, 11, 10, 11 at that point. Yeah, that's amazing, like, that that, that lady could be so life-changing. Um, and I don't know if she even knew it, that she was so life-changing at the time. I don't think she knew it either, because years later, I went to visit her at the school, the same elementary school, and she was losing her memory. Oh, really? She was already on a path where she, I, I, don't, I, I assumed maybe she would have dementia, because she was an older lady. She was, and, and you could tell, because she was so strict. But she didn't remember who I was. Mm. And I and this was I went back in junior high school. Oh, yeah, that's not that, that long. So, that, so she was already showing signs that maybe she had dementia. I don't know if she's still alive today, but if it, she changed my life. And she don't even know it. <laughs> she didn't remember me then. She, she couldn't have known that she changed my life. That's awesome. That y'all, got, y'all ran off two teachers, OK? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and she chose I don't know if she was placed and she had to yeah. but she was game she was game she took no, out long she was like I'm about that life so you could try me <laughs> right right that's dope that's dope do you think the reading out loud helps you with your public speaking as well you know that's funny you say that because I didn't really I don't think about that like I think of public speaking as a a different kind of skill Mm. And I think public speaking comes from hearing other people speak. Okay. And in what capacity? In, um, in the same setting? Yeah. Like, like even at your job when you, you know, executives hold meetings, mm-hmm. pay attention to that. Um, and I, I think pub, my public speaking, I, I'll be very honest with you, public speaking is terrifying. 
I, and I always like to be prepared before I, I'm speaking because if you, if I'm not prepared and you call me out, I'm just like, oh, wait a minute now, hold on. I get I get nervous, and so I don't even think that I've mastered public speaking. I know sometimes in 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 depending on the format, um, people say that you know you sound confident, and I'm sure I do, but I'm terrified. Like I'm I'm crying on the inside because it's not something that I love to do. But I think for me. The public speaking part comes from, I had to take public speaking classes mm -hmm. through my college career, undergrad and in grad school. And I, I try to pay attention to how other people engage an audience, mm -hmm. but it was always writing for me. It was always pen on paper for me. That was yeah. where I, I was the most com comfortable when it comes to saying it out loud. I'm also Caribbean. So certain words that I may use in passing, some people culturally, they're like, what? So I would get like insecure about that. Like, yes, I'm not speaking another language, but you just don't understand maybe my, my, the words I'm using, I'm choosing to use from a cultural perspective. Yes. Maybe my tone, some cases it may seem harsher or yes. more um, abrasive, but it's not because it's right. just a cultural thing. Yeah. So I've, been, I, I've had times where I've been very self-conscious about what public speaking because depending on your audience, you don't really know how it's going to be received. Right. I had my first uh, culture shock, I guess I would say, with Americans. Um, mm -hmm. I was born in America, but all my family's born in Jamaica. I'm the first American. Really? I yeah. never knew that about you. I think yeah. you're all around. American. No. My, even my sister was born in Jamaica. Um, so yeah, my whole, whole family's Jamaican. And my first time realizing that we say things differently is when somebody asked me what I had for dinner and I s said spaghetti and mincemeat. And they didn't know what mincemeat was. And I didn't know another word for it. <laughs> Hell, I'm Jamaican. I don't know what that means. Oh, you don't say mincemeat? Like ground beef. Girl. I'm Ask so another Jamaican. Jamaican. I'm so Jamaican, I say bully beef. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> bully, bully beef is specific to something. But like, yes, it is. I, I would say, I would say ground, ground beef or ground chicken or whatever. Oh, whatever. OK. I would, we would literally say whatever it was on the package because we don't really eat that in Jamaica. Right, right. Well, I guess they would say minced meat because it's minced. You know, Jamaicans like definitions before they like the word. <laughs> we name things based on the description. Yes, yes. But I'm not gonna. But you're right. I'm not gonna say that. That's other Jamaicans don't say that. Right, I'm right, right. Say it because we didn't really eat that. In yeah. Jamaica. We don't. We wouldn't call it anything other than right. What grown chicken? Like we were right, right. We were like, yeah, that's what right. that is. <laughs> but I understand your, you know, being apprehensive in speaking in front of people because you didn't know if you'd be using the right words. And I can't remember other words that my family would use, but um, there were other words that I would use with my American peers, and they were like, "What, what are you talking about?" Right. And yeah, I, I would go home and ask my mom, what is the American version of this phrase? <laughs> but talk to me about um, being afraid of public speaking and doing it anyway. Man, it's terrifying. I mean, it's easy now because everything is like video virtual. Mm -hmm. You know, we're yeah. edit it. But I, I will not lie. It's one of the reasons why I do not miss corporate America because corporate America is predominantly white. Mm -hmm. And it's predominantly white American. Mm -hmm. And there is not a lot of culture infused in the way you communicate in corporate America. And and when I say what when I when I say that, I mean specific to black people. Mm. Okay. Um it's easy for black people outside of the United States to assimilate to American culture and the uh, and buy into the American dream of you come, you go to school, you get an education, you get the job, mm -hmm. and you work your way up the ladder. One of the challenges that I've seen, though, is when you get into, when you do all of those things, right, and you get the corporate job. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes you realize because you don't look the cultural part of corporate America, mm -hmm. there's another type of challenge that you're faced with. And goes back, go, going back into articulation, again, if you don't sound how the corporate lingo or that company culture sounds, mm -hmm. you're challenged. Hmm. I guess the perception can be 
how did you get here? Or what college did you go to? What education did you have to get this far? And, 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 I, and I will say there could be two folds to that, right? There could be the, fold, the part of it where as a black person in corporate America, navigating corporate culture and some people call it code switching. Mm-hmm. And there's the, the white perspective of looking at black, the black p- person in, in the corporate role and questioning if they're qualified because mm-hmm. there's so much negative misconceptions about what it means to be black and this idea that if you've made it you you had to have had a hand or you had to have mm-hmm. gotten some kind of um reparations or what, what do you what, you know when you go to college and you get accepted or you might only have okay. been accepted because you're the black person you're fighting all of these other things and so language and how you articulate things they they, they you feel like you're you're, you're there's a microscope Mm. And so there's just these added layers, and I've struggled with that. And I know there's other maybe you know black people of color that's had similar things. Mm-hmm. Speaking specifically from about my journey, corporate America sometimes feel like politics, mm. and you have to get up there and say the right words. Gotcha. You have to you have to get up there, present yourself in a way that's tailored for white America. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I don't like that feeling of if I say something from a cultural perspective, like ask me anything, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, um, I, I, you know, honestly, I don't have an experience with corporate America, so I wouldn't even know what it, they would ask you. <laughs> um, like, like are, are you, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of an example. Like, did you complete the report? report? Right. Or, or, or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, then I'll send it to you um, in email. But but I, I'm just I'm I don't know if that is even, that's even a good example. But it, it's I'm very direct. Right. But it's a cultural directness that is, right. is not abrasive. Right. And I, I understand what you mean yeah. about um. Um. It's it's as if I I'll I'll send it to you. But in corporate America, it's kind of you like have to. I don't want to say kiss ass, but. <laughs> Oh, I'll, I'll come by your desk. I'll show you all. We can go over the report together. I'm not gotcha. doing all of that. Gotcha. It is unnecessary for me. Right, right. It is like I'm qualified. I'm hired because I'm qualified to do the job, and that is what I would like to do. Mm-hmm. In corporate settings, sometimes you feel like you also have to just play these chess games. Gotcha. And being more engaging and being more conversational. Oh. From a cultural perspective, I don't think it's even just Caribbean backgrounds. I think from a black person's perspective, we just want to get to the point, get it done and, and, and exit. Mm-hmm. See, I don't, I don't really have an experience with corporate America. Uh, my first job was at a Christian school in, well, it wasn't my first job, but um, my first real job, if you want to call it that, was working for and with black people. Mm-hmm. So I didn't have an experience until I was, mid twenties, um, working for anybody, but a black person. And then once I got into the car industry, um, which of course has white people, black people, people of all races, but it's an abrasive culture anyway. Um, so you didn't have to say things a certain way. Um, you You didn't, right, right. Right. Yes. Very abrasive culture, which was, um, which was very New York. So I was already comfortable with it. Um, so I didn't have that experience and I, I don't know personally what that's like, but of course I hear about it. My mom was in corporate America for years, um, before she got back to teaching. And I, and of course, you know, we all have cultural differences, you know, black people, we are loud. (laughs) We are loud. We are rowdy. We, we, we express emotion. Yes. Um, white people tend to be a little quieter or, and I won't say quieter, but they just, express their excitement differently i and, and and at times maybe even for us we we would explain some of that as being passive aggressive okay in some settings because, yes depending because it because you say things in a less loud gotcha. way doesn't mean that you aren't being shady oh that's true and and and, and black people don't really do that right i said what i said <laughs> and we're moving on. That's kind of how we move. And so in, in corporate America for me, because it's pre- usually predominantly white, that mm-hmm. could be a challenge for you as a black person. 
So for me, I, it's not. And so going back to the public speaking things, I've always had to be, it's like subconscious or conscious about that. Mm-hmm. And speaking and, and maybe that was I don't know maybe that's my own insecurities or just the feeling of being judged mm-hmm. um, as a as a woman as a woman of color being black specifically mm-hmm. um, that it, it's not always fun so um, I guess that was just a long way of answering why public speaking has sometimes had has it had its challenge in mm-hmm. because of the setting I was in. Gotcha. How were you able to power through it, though? Because sometimes fear debilita- debilitates people yeah, and they, they don't push through. Absolutely. So how are you able to acknowledge that you're afraid and mm-hmm. still do it anyway? I, I, I've had to count, count to 10 or like just 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 slow down. One of the suggestions I've gotten, even like recently um, in grad school, is just speak slower. Mm um just breathe you know because it's anxiety it's a form of form of anxiety when you're like oh my god I'm, I'm getting ready to go into this public setting or speaking for this um be prepared like know what your talking points are because if yeah. you don't know what you're talking about you're gonna get flustered easily mm-hmm. so just have some bullet points speak slower so that you're able to think while you speak to get your thoughts out and some of those things have worked and to be honest with you sometimes I've just had to power through it. I just had to get it done and just be as comfortable, as confident as possible and tell myself it's just, it's, it's not that serious. Yeah. Something. Power through it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's dope. So you, um, you host networking events mm-hmm. um, in the community. You host them on Facebook Live, Instagram Live, where you are highlighting women in business. Yeah. Of course, you're, you're giving away knowledge. You're, you're letting these women know what you've been through and building your own brand and your own business. Why give away information like that instead of charging? Because you could charge a lot for that. Well, you, to fun, the funny part about that is I'm starting to charge now. Right. <laughs> I'm starting to charge now. Mm-hmm. But for the longest, it was about building community. Mm-hmm. It's about I'm passionate about women. And I'm passionate about specifically Black women. And I, and I know... Women overall, we've all faced challenges, but I'm passionate about black women because I'm a black woman. Like it's just what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, I I'm passionate about the black community as a whole. So the longest for me, you know, I, I recently asked someone else if they they didn't have to worry about making a living, what would they do with their life? And I kind of had to think about that for myself. Well, they kind of threw it back to me. And I said, if I didn't have to worry about making a living, I would direct my, all of my efforts to helping women. Because I grew up in environments where women were abused. Hmm. And I, you know, even in my, my younger years, I remember being in relationships that were necessarily healthy for me. Mm-hmm. And it was, and you don't realize some of the, the things that you take on mentally and emotionally because of what you saw growing up. Mm -hmm. right so I I the strong women that I saw in my in my communities were were often talked about it badly if they Mm -hmm. stood up for themselves or I I guess going back to being loud that negative perception of being black and being female Mm -hmm. um whenever you saw that it was like they were less likely to have men in their lives because oh which man want to deal with that right Right. Mm -hmm. And then there was the other side of when you don't have a backbone, you don't speak up for yourself, you're going to be taken advantage of and hurt. So for my whole life, I feel like I've had to try to find the balance between the two. And so I care about helping black women because I, I want to dismantle the misconceptions of this angry black women. A lot of black women aren't angry and black just because we're born black. Right. <laughs> Angry. Right. There's a lot of layers, layered stuff there. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of women that are hurt, mm-hmm. that are abused, mm-hmm. that are disrespected. And I know that black men have their own journeys and they, their own challenges. But one of the things for me is we have to become better at understanding each other's triggers to be better for each other, but also to be better individually. So that is predominantly why when I say 
you know, my platform now by her own rules, helping women become their best selves personally, professionally. I mean that. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't like this loud, angry, aggressive. No, like I, I, I and any times I've exhibited that, I've had to ex- address, well, why is that coming out? What is it that I'm, what emotions am I releasing that I haven't addressed? Because that's what that's about. Yeah. There are things that are hurting you that you haven't addressed and you were laughing out because you're not heard, you're not respected. Mm-hmm. I was talking to someone yesterday about how sometimes the male species, they're just dumb. And I don't, I don't want to generalize all men, but I was using specifically about how you're just walking down the street as a woman and, and men will get upset if you don't talk to them, you don't address their high because they feel entitled. They, I was just going to say that. There is a... <laughs> There's a weird sense of entitlement that women encounter in public spaces. Yes. Um, the most irritating for me, of course, the demanding me speak to you um, if I don't want to is exactly. irritating. But yes. what irritates me the most is demanding that I make physical contact with you. Oh, come oh. here, girl. Give me a hug or oh. the hand on the on the small of your back. Oh, I know. You, you are not entitled to touch me. And I don't have to touch you either. And it's a constant battle every time you walk out of your house. Absolutely. And absolutely. So based on that conversation, I was just simply explaining that you don't have a clue what women encounter every day just from being women. Period. I'm not trying to say that being a man is easier. Right. You don't have to navigate a world where you feel your very existence is to please somebody outside of yourself. Mm-hmm. specifically the male species, because men have been programmed to view women as things to objectify, mm. of, 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 of not humans, not, mm. not people, not, not someone with an opinion, mm-hmm. and with her own perspective, with her own experiences. They're not taught to speak to us as people. They're taught to pursue us. They're mm. taught to invade our space. They're taught to think for us. They're taught to tell us what we need to do with our own bodies. They're taught to own us. Mm. And from that perspective, going back to even the Black female experience, when we we engage with Black men, and they've been taught poorly too. Mm -hmm. And it's frustrating. Right. When you have that layer of of misogyny, Mm -hmm. then you have the Black women experience where a lot of these Black women have to be the men and the women in their households. Mm -hmm. And, and then um, men try to insert themselves in that and don't find how, don't find where they need to assist mm. and not try to come in and dominate. Mm. That is, is frustrating. Oh, God, yeah. Women sometimes can't, if you, if you consider being a woman, or being a woman how, do you, how do you rely on men you, you haven't been taught to be able to trust and rely on? How do you become, how do you become more feminine or back off and be at ease when you haven't had a long history of having men where that's been made available to you. Mm-hmm. Black women, there's layers to this. Right. It's not just about if you see a black woman that's angry, oh, oh she just born that way. There's right. layers to this. There's and the, this it takes stuff. understanding, like you said, um, understanding on a man's part, they need to, you know, understand where women are coming from and then understanding on our end because we don't know their journey. Exactly. They don't know ours. Exactly. We don't know their journey. So I get that. Understanding the two. It's not about anti-men. And I, and I mm-hmm. hate when the, the conversation turns to, oh, these feminists are anti-men. Feminism is just about choice. Feminism is about women knowing her choices to make those informed choices for herself. Whether you want to be a stay-at-home mom, whether you want to be the independent, career-driven, it is just about choice. Right. People insert conversations to to confuse the masses to try to make a point. That's or, what feminism or, or, is. or they just become defensive. They they feel something in them has been triggered, Absolutely. and it, it they become defensive and feel that this has become man hate. Exactly. Um, it's not supposed to be about man hate. It's just really about trying to help men better understand how they've been taught toxic behavior that's been disruptive to us. Mm-hmm. That's really what we're trying to get them to understand. Um, men are necessary. Women are of necessary. Course. We need each other. Of course. So if you understand 
your toxic behavior, maybe you can change them. Right. So if you're one of those demanding to touch women, <laughs> come here, baby, give me a hug. Don't be like that. Give me a hug. Stop doing that. <laughs> woman, what you wouldn't even want a man to do to your daughter. Don't do to women or expect from women what you wouldn't want your daughter to do in regards to a man. And it's like right. disconnect. And it's weird that, that, yes, there is a disconnect. Um, at, as your own person, you can value what you want for yourself and all that, but you're not teaching it to your sons and to your daughters. Exactly. Um, I, I don't believe that there should be double standards in a lot of areas. Um, I teach my son to respect himself, to respect women. Uh, who knows? Of course, he's going to grow up and be who he's going to be. But I try to instill in him not just respect for a woman's body, but for his own. Exactly. You know, um, if you respect your body, then you're going to be able to respect somebody. Right. Else. Absolutely. Right. Here I am. I can have roughly one baby every nine months. Mm -hmm. Roughly. Right. Give or take with twins and, you know, whatever. Um, he can have as many babies as he wants. Exactly. My theory has always been unload the gun <laughs> don't put a bullet a bulletproof vest on the victim unload the gun you know don't go spread seed everywhere so you have to train your boys to respect themselves and women so i want to get into by her own rules how long have you had this business now okay so by her own rules actually started out at a different company mm -hmm. so i started the blog the, the pop culture news blog in 20, 20, 2008. Mm -hmm. I had no lot, jobs lined up because it was a reception and the housing market crashed and I was just graduating. So there was nothing lined up for me. And I the, the internship at Jive Records, I got an assignment to um, research blogs, entertainment blogs, predominantly black entertainment platforms to advertise artists. Mm -hmm. And through that, research I was like man I could start one I could start a blog so my blog was called cotton candy because it was about treating your sweet tooth the mm -hmm. entertainment you know what I mean your artist your latest you know pop culture fix and fashion so that was my blog so the company originally was cotton candy media mm -hmm. and that went on for so long I mean I did that for eight years to be honest I was freelancing I was working a regular job I was not in my field I was working I was doing more customer service support role while I was freelancing because, again, I hadn't gotten the corporate experience, so I was getting the corporate job. Mm -hmm. in so I was freelancing or moonlighting and then working the operations, customer support roles. And I did it for about eight years, and then um, I felt like I had no real specific direction and I needed to realign. Mm -hmm. So I finally did get the you know, corporate position in 2015 or yes, 20, 2015. And I was kind of over the blog stuff. I was also over talking about pop culture and celebrities. Like I was like, I don't care about these people. Not that I don't care about these people, but who cares, right? right. It's not important news. I want to talk about, I want to give relationship advice. I want to talk about finances, financial literacy. I want to talk about, I want to get to the hardest and stuff. And so in 20, the, the blog was like dormant for like two years. And in 2017, then I, I rebranded. I changed it to buy her own rules because that spoke to me. That spoke to who I am. That spoke to the, you know, women. Any woman can, can be, live by her own rules if she yeah. chooses. Mm -hmm. So that was like, oh, I love that. That's it. So then I had to rechange, I had to change the name of the company. So I'm like, if this fits, buy her own rules, Bore Media. The acronym of buy her, it was just easy. So that all transitioned in 2017. That's dope. That's dope. So what are you doing with the, the company? I know you're doing um, PR, mm. right? And you're doing marketing and things like that. So tell me, what's, what's a day in your life like with this company? Um, so I've always been, because I know what it's like to live through a recession, like mm -hmm. kind of like what we're going right now, I've always been prepared. I've always had like a job and a, and a hustle, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I still had my, my marketing jobs, you know, for the last four or five years, mm -hmm. five years. And I was still doing the, my own business and my events and, right. and all that kind of stuff. So with the pandemic, all of that kind of changed for me. And I was faced with, I got laid off because 
My job was client facing. My, my job was, I did digital marketing for a company that was more client facing. We, we, we ran events right. and you can't have events. Mm -hmm. And if the company can't do what makes the money, then jobs aren't essential. So I was one of the people who got laid off because we're not marketing events. That's not happening. Right. And that was, it was at that point that I had to make a decision outside of trying to be safe and making it through all of this. I just, I took some months off. I wasn't thinking about getting another job. There wasn't any really, but I wasn't even thinking about getting another job. I was just kind of like, I'm going to take care of my mental health, my well being. Um, I do have a company, like I have the LLC, I have the bank account, I have a legit company. But again, that was dormant. I wasn't really doing anything with it. Mm -hmm. So once I got over the, the whole anxiety of catching a virus and potentially dying, and I was literally mentally un, unstable. I was, mm -hmm. and I'm sure a lot of other people. It wasn't until maybe two months ago that I was like, okay, I'm going to really do this for real. I'm not going to worry about getting a job or working for another person. I'm going to work for myself full time this time. And so a day in the life for me is upsetting the meetings. I'm reaching out to people. I have accounts. I'm, up, I'm on Upwork. I'm on Fiverr. I have, I'm trying to get my minority and black women owned with, well, it's women and minority, no minority and women owned black Enterprise? I'm saying it wrong, but it's... M-W-B-E? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I'm going through the city to get that done. Uh, um, my application is taking a little while, but so I can start getting some government contracts. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I've, I've done also, I've, I've networked, network, network. I'm telling you, work having a network of people that refer you to stuff has just been a blessing. And... You know, I, people say network, but when you say network, you always think about going to networking events, mm -hmm. talking to people, right. but you, they don't think about it in terms of relationships you've already built. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for that, right. I'd probably be struggling right now because there are people who I've worked with directly at previous companies. There are people who... There was one lady, I had, we didn't work together directly, but we worked at the same company. And I simply reached out to her on LinkedIn. And I said, I, you know, I see that you're, you also have your own company. Like, you know, I would love to work with you. Maybe we can help each other out. Mm -hmm. From that conversation, she's been referring me contracts. I have a meeting with one, a, a company next week. From a former employee or a former coworker, she mm -hmm. sent me a, 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 a platform to sign up for where they send me contracts so uh, talk, talk to me about the 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 contracts and, and what you do for other companies oh okay so some companies outsource marketing they don't have an in-house marketing department mm -hmm. or they may have in-house marketers but they may need market research for mm -hmm. a product launch or a new service mm -hmm. they may need to do market research on that particular segment because they haven't done it yet so they may look for agencies to work with right mm -hmm. um there you know some companies like, let's say one example i'm looking to to do a complete redesign of a website for a school right mm -hmm. um in doing that they're, they're going to want copy copy work copywriting and they yes, yes, yes. You know, an optimization so because i have a digital marketing background that's my specialty i do more minimal front-end web design work i but i but thank god i have again people that i work with that I have contracts with that are skilled to do some of the things that I don't necessarily do. And we have, you know, agreements with each other. So I've been able to form agreements with other contractors, other independent workers. Um, I've got, been getting a ton of referrals from people who just know me and have worked with me and know my qualifications. So a day in the life of what I do, I'm setting up meetings. I'm securing contracts like maybe three six months doing digital marketing strategy gotcha. doing um social media marketing strategy doing just marketing templates marketing plans mm -hmm. that's typically what a day in the life looks like right now yeah day, i'm go, i'm hoping that i'll get longer contracts for like ye a year mm -hmm. but 
So that's kind of what my day looks like now, but it's exciting. Yeah. Yeah, it's I can imagine. Exciting. I can imagine because during this pandemic, it's been very hard on a lot of people, a lot of people, especially people who are dealing with loss. Yep. Um, and another side to the pandemic, it is not brighter or I, I'm not putting any, um, not turning down the light on, you know, the losses that have been experienced. But yep. the other side to the pandemic is people are finding what they're really passionate about because they're basically pushed into a corner. Um, you lost your job, you know, because there was no work in your field because nobody can be one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, no events. Um, so you basically pushed in a corner and you had to ask yourself from what I'm hearing, well, what do I do now? Exactly. Um, and when there's no job to find in your field, well, you looked at what you were already good at. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about pursuing this full time? How, how, how's that feel now? It's scary. You know, you're going to have times when you have a project that you get paid up front and then you may have weeks where you're not getting any new thing and you've got bills, right? Mm -hmm. um, thank God I'm in a spot where I'm okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not one of these people that is like, if I don't get paid today, I don't eat today. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in a spot like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's scary because it's new territory for me. Again, because I've, I've experienced a recession, I, I, I've I always had backup. I've always had a plan A and a plan B. One source is in steady income and, and, and one source is not steady, but I, it's, I can manage. Right. So now that my comfort, that, 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 that source, consistent sources income of, is no longer there, um, that's the scary part. Yeah. Well, what's, what, what I've learned from this is that I'm more capable than I thought. Like, you don't know what you're capable of doing until you're in a position you, you've got to do it. If I don't have the money to pay my rent this month, like, I, 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 might, I might potentially pay, face eviction. But what I've learned is I got gumption. Like, a girl is doing it. Like, I'm still doing it. Like, you know, so that's kind of what I've learned. Like you, we always, some, well, we don't always, but sometimes we underestimate our own capabilities. Mm -hmm. Like I prepared for this. Like, mm -hmm. hello, I had a whole company because I remember I, you know, I had to pivot. Mm -hmm. So I remember that experience. So I was prepared for this. Like, yes. so I, I, I'm, I'm stronger and I'm better equipped than I gave myself credit for. That's dope. That's dope. And I love that you brought up comfort, you know, that your comfort is gone. I've always yeah. heard that growth doesn't happen in comfort. Uh, so now that that comfort, comfortable spot is gone, it seems like you're, you're doing well. You've got contracts. They're not as long as you'd like, but you have them and you have referrals and exactly. you, you are broadening your, your network. Exactly. You, your, your small unit is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I'm, and I'm in a growing phase right now. Very yeah. early growing phase, but growth is happening. So I'm very happy about that. That's amazing. Does your um, your upbringing, maybe your childhood or your adoles adolescence, mirror any of what you're doing today? Mm, okay, I'm trying to think back. Outside of the writing things, um, I was athletic. Mm -hmm. I was on, I mean, I wasn't like the exceptional, like I wasn't the star of anything, right? I was... I ran track in high school, but I was yeah, always, I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> I was always into fitness, so that's still um, relevant today. Like I'm, I have worked out this morning, so I'm always, I'm still that way. I will say, I guess from a an upbringing perspective, my mom and my dad, they always instilled, um, just having your own, working hard for anything you wanted being independent, always getting yourself if need be. Um, I'm pretty res resilient, I would say. Like, mm -hmm. I never, I don't get, if, if things don't go my way or if things are falling apart, I'm going to have my moment. I'm going to cry. I'm going to ball up in the corner. I'm going to have a f moment. I'm, I'm going to do all of that, but I'm going to get up and I'm going to keep it going. Yeah. So maybe that, I think maybe that comes from my parents and again, being West Indian and being like, you pick a field, you, you go to school, you get an education, you get, you get a job, you just get it done. Mm -hmm. That, and I had an older sister too, who was kind of like similar. She, we were eight years apart. So she, in a lot of ways, there were times when she felt more like a mom 
then an older sister. She was also another person who was just kind of like driven mm -hmm. and successful at things. So I had that as an example. Um, so yeah, like there was no time to like cry and go roll up in the corner and go look at who's going to take care of me. It was like, you're going to figure it out. Right, right. That makes sense. Um, getting into the world of media is a big deal. You know, the, it, there are a lot of people that want to get into the world of media. Yeah. How would you, if somebody was looking to get into digital marketing, what would you tell them that their, their first step should be? You should start it yourself. The, the media industry is very... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? It's not secure. Mm. Not a secure industry. Um, you know, there's a ton of uh, uh, turnover. There's a ton of people revolving doors. Like mm -hmm. people will be at one company in six months, they're in another company. It's a constant revolving door. And the, the beauty of the living in the digital era is that you can literally start your own website. You don't, you don't got to be great at it. Mm -hmm. You can learn as you go. Yeah. I would say... To just simply start a blog. It's free to start a blog. You can literally get on WordPress or Blogger or whatever without any kind of hosting company and start telling your story and start telling other people's stories. It's really easy. You know, the hard part, I guess, is getting traction, is getting more visibility and getting people to start, you know, taking you seriously and maybe look at it as a career or making money at it. That could be the challenge in part two. But it's really easy to start, like, just start it. Stop waiting for people to give you permission. Stop waiting for people to do it for you. Or stop letting, waiting for people to let you in the door of their company. Because a lot of these big media companies went online because people were online. People started growing their own. And it was just easy for you to just look at your phone and instead of going watching CNN on TV, CNN had to get online. You know what I'm saying? So we are the culture. We make change. So get on. Do it. Start doing it yourself. I love that. I love that. <laughs> what do you have next for Born Media or Internet in general? I, I kicked off my first webinar, my first solo webinar, I, I should say, where I hosted, um, basically telling people like how to build a, a digital platform or how to, how to create a, a digital presence mm -hmm. for your, your brand and your business. And that went so well. So I'll be doing more webinars like that and that's when i mean i'm actually starting to charge stuff yeah now. yeah yeah you don't join the free webinar when it's there if to get access to the video i'm charging for that mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. i'm i'm now doing paid consultations no more 15 minute free because 15 minute free could quickly turn into 30 and 40 i don't have time for that yeah. i've got contracts i'm trying to get now so my time is limited mm -hmm. i have to be strict about how to how i allocate my time now because i'm doing this full time for real now i can't i don't have the comfort of having another salary so I've had to start setting it up. It was someone suggested it to me actually, and I'm grateful that they did that. That set up your paid consultations for anyone that comes on that wants to take advantage of your services. Then you kind of waive the fee. Mm. But just to simply get an out of my time, I am not talking to you for an, oh, giving you free information for hour a day. You take it and I'm I'm over here and still need to pay my bills. No, right, right, right. I'm not doing right. that anymore. And I did it for a long, very, very long time. But mama, my mama's got a business to run. I mm -hmm. can't do that. Do you think it's good to do it for free at first to get your name out there? Yes, I, that's and that's why I did a lot of things for free. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's just been a, a good strategy mm -hmm. when you're starting out you kind of have to give to get. Yeah. I hear and that I, a lot. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that just because you reach a certain level that you still don't give. Right. You right. just get more strategic about what it is you're giving mm -hmm. and how much time you're allocating to it. Like the webinars are still free. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just that if you're not, you, you didn't tap in, mm -hmm. you don't get free access to the recording. Gotcha. That makes sense. I've, I've monetized that. That makes sense. So you I know why that... You know what that also makes sense? Um, because a lot of things can be given out for free. And I do believe that it's still good to give. However, yeah. if people don't make an investment, yes, they don't really, really pay attention to what's there. Yeah. I really believe that. Um, there's, I've signed up for so many free classes I didn't attend. <laughs> but let me tell you, if I paid for it, I did. And I took notes. Yeah. <laughs> took notes, too. Different. It's like going to school. Mm-hmm. 
I was an undergrad. Thank God I didn't have any debt out of undergrad. Like I had a grant. I did good in high school. I had a good grant going to my mom helped me out with the undergrad. You know, they would get financial aid. Um, when I got to grad school, I, oh, I'm paying for this. Oh, I'll pay, I'm paying attention. I'm getting nothing but A's. Like mm-hmm. you, your mindset changes when there's a bigger investment. There is, there is. Even if that invest, even if it only seems like an investment, because you said that the webinars are free, but of course they have to invest in themselves and then it becomes free. So even if it only seems like an investment to you, you're more likely to pay attention. Um, and, and, and on that note, I still would say give things away yeah. that are still of value. Because, okay, yes. for example, yes. in a digital age, people don't just buy from you because you set up shop. Mm-hmm. They buy from you because they believe in you. They believe mm-hmm. in the product and service that you are providing. And the only way for to get people to believe in the product and services that you're providing is to first show them. Mm-hmm. It's to first explain it to them. Mm-hmm. So if you're doing a Facebook Live, you're doing an Insta. I haven't really done any Facebook Live. You know, IG Live I've done. Yes, yes, yes. If, if you do those things, and you get on and you tell people, you know, hi, I'm, I'm, I'm Tony and I'm a digital marketer. And I, I recognize a lot of people want to start their own business. And I just want to share really quickly with you five tips for doing that. You're giving them value. Mm-hmm. You've given them something first that they can to look to so that when it's time to sell them something, they're more likely to opt in because right. you're, you've already given them something. So yeah. I would say for your business, give value, offer tips. When it comes to going more into specifics and deal, detail and tailoring customizable strategy, they've got to pay for that. Mm-hmm. But even for something like, I'm trying to think. Um, man, I lost it. I, I had a good one too. I, I was networking. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm get, getting back on track. Okay. When you, when you see people that are doing things that you want to do, mm-hmm reach out there's nothing wrong with reaching out but here's the thing that people fail at doing they fail to explain what it is that they would like to offer up to gain knowledge to gain access a lot of people go about it is i love what you do i want to do that too can you tell me can you show me that is not how you do that No, no 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 i like what you're doing i in fact it's good to be specific Mm -hmm. I saw the article that you published about this topic on this day because you've done your research. Mm -hmm. Anybody could just say, I like what you're doing. Then you may go one step further and say, I would like to learn from you. I I know that you may not be in a position to give my, give you, give a lot of your time to me. So is there any skill sets that you're looking for? Is there administrative work that you would like to outsource? I may be able to help you with that. That's how you do that. Mm. A lot of these younger kids coming out of school, they just want, I, I want to be paid. I'm not doing no free internship. Mm-hmm. And when you say the administrative work, that's like emails and filing. It's simple stuff that most people know how to do. You could do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, that, that's how you build relationships. So then, then when you get indoor and you actually start doing stuff, try to do it right. Because I, I, I meet a lot of people like that, too. They come in, they try to act like they help you. They, ma- they make a mess. You got to go back and do over the, all the work that they, they said they were doing for you. Right, you know, right, right. You got to actually do a good job so that maybe you can get hired or you can mm-hmm. get a referral to be hired. Or know, even get them to be your mentor because you're doing work for them and you're, you're exactly. learning. Exactly. People will become more of a mentor if, if you're also offering up value. That's exactly how I got my mentor. She, we, I haven't, we haven't said... I'm her mentee. She's my mentor, but she's kind of been that because I reached out about helping her organization as well as trying to help mine. Now she's sending me things. She's giving me feedback and constructive criticism. And now she's sending me projects because I offered up something. Yeah. I think that's a very good key that you just offered the community. Yeah. Uh, I think that is very good because people do ask um, for things sometimes and there's nothing wrong with asking. And you should, if you hate asking, build up the courage and ask. But I love that you gave an ha- a how to the ask. How and do you also, go about that? People sometimes don't know that they have skills that they can offer up. That's another part of the challenge. I, I do remember being green and not thinking I knew anything. And mm-hmm. oh my God, how could I even work with that person? Oh my God, how could I even 
speak to this person. They're so much advanced. And you don't, you, we don't give ourselves enough credit. Like, I'm good at writing. Like, I could have been writing emails. Mm -hmm. like, I could have been writing, you know, doing resumes. I could have been, you, we don't, we all, we seem to think that if somebody is the Beyonce in their industry and you're starting out, you have nothing to offer. You have mm. nothing. And you, that's not true. There are skills you have that comes natural to you that people will pay for. What is that? Make a list. Or just simply ask them, I don't know where I would fit in, but what do you need? Maybe I can help you. And let them tell you where you can fit in. But we all often think, too, we don't have anything to offer, so we don't offer up anything. And then the person's looking at us like, you just try to get me to show you all my all the things I've had to work over these 10 years for. You ain't trying to help me. Mm -hmm. But you, you just have to understand it's from two different perspectives. You're undervaluing yourself. Mm -hmm. And they're just, they have limited time. They've got time for that. Mm -hmm. so just try to understand both, both sides of it. Absolutely. That's dope. Thank you, Internet. <laughs> so tell me, well, tell the people, where can we find you? I am pretty consistent all over social media. Um, on Instagram, Twitter, well, Twitter is specifically kind of different, but Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, you can find me at I am Miss Tony. N not M I S S, just M S T O N I. Mm -hmm. I am M S T O N I. Um, you know the don't flash the gotcha. username. I'm consistent across the board. My Twitter is is I underscore I A M underscore Miss Tony. It's kind of it's similar, but it's just with the underscore between each I am. Um, on my board media and by her own rules, consistent across the board. You'll find it. Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, Instagram. I'm on Snapchat and TikTok and all that, but I don't necessarily use those. I'm an older millennial, so I'm not really there yet with the TikTok and all that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm pretty consistent. Board media and by our own rules, again, across the board, you can find me. Dope, dope. Last question, Ms. Oh, Tony. sorry, I forgot. And I always forget this. Websites, board media. Yes. Com. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I would have squeezed it in there anyway because I do know you have a website. So you'd have just seen it stream across the bottom. Oh, it came. Good, good, good. <laughs> uh, so last question, Miss Tony. What is a quote that you live by? Oh, that's a, such a good question. I wasn't prepared for this question. But pertaining to business or just in general? That you live by? Um, I, I love the Maya Angelou quote. People always, people don't remember how, people don't always remember what you do or what you say, what you say but they remember how you make them feel. I try to keep that in the back of my mind too and how I also handle my business because mm. I'm not, I, I, I would, I'm not going to say I'm the, I'm the best at everything. But one of the things that's given me referring customers or coming back is because I have excellent customer service skills and I try to make people feel important and that their concerns are important. So mm -hmm. um, that's definitely one. There's another one, but it's still in my mind right now. Mm. Um, but that would be like up there. That's a good one. That's a good one. And I, I have always liked that quote. I actually just had that conversation with my son two weeks ago, three weeks ago, regarding his father, because his father has, has passed a long time now. So he doesn't remember a lot about him. Yeah. And, you know, I try to, you know, invigorate his memory and ask him what he remembers and talk about stories. And so rather than ask him what he remembered, I told him to detail how he felt when he was with his father and how he thought his father felt. And he just lit up because he could remember the feeling and so I thought that was really dope <laughs> yeah I love that yes yeah, yeah if, you, if you take that approach in your life you'll have better interrelation interpersonal relationships mm -hmm. too you you have to remember going back to how we speak to each other right mm -hmm. communicate speak to people speak to people don't speak at people and yeah. try to find commonalities where you can connect that of, often you have better long-term relationships in both business and in your personal life because you come at each other from a personable perspective. So yes. I love that quote. Yes, it's a dope one. 
Tony, thank you so much for being on. I'm very happy for you. I'm glad you were back into a corner because now you are just going to blow up. Uh, I, I hope so. I'm ready for it. I'm preparing for it. So thank you so much. You're, and, you're ready. You've been doing it for years. Uh, thank you. And thanks for the invitation. I believe in everything that you're doing too. I see you. I see you with your organization tied together. I said that right. Yeah. Right? Yes. <laughs> now that you're hosting your own um, podcast. I, I'm, I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Nerve wracking. Um, scary. Yeah, is. Yeah. All that good stuff. But so what? Just do it. Do it. <laughs> Just do it. You're doing it. Just You're do doing it. it. And I hope what people can gain from what you said throughout this podcast and what you just said now and what I said about even being scared is that um, the people you see that are doing dope things are not doing it without fear. Not always. Maybe once they become seasoned and all that stuff. Right. But they're not, they're not doing it without fear. They're just doing it anyway. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What are you going to do? Buckle? Fall? Like, no. Sometimes you have yeah. to keep going. Yeah. 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 So we don't live a life full of regrets. Exactly. That's another good one. Yep. I love that one. Thank you, Tony. I can't wait to have you back on because I will. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <laughs> You're welcome. Later. No, I mean, it's, there's differences, different situations, but mm -hmm. I don't think anybody's trapped to do anything. Yeah. Like, yeah. you can find something positive to do in jail. Like, you're never trapped. Yeah. Like, you can find you're calling somebody who got life in jail right now, mm -hmm. but he made his life decision to preach to whoever comes in there teach them or speak to the youth. Like, you know, they had these scared straight programs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're ever trapped. We just, I think we fall deep into a hole and we just decide that that hole is unclimbable. Mm -hmm. Rather than like, cause some people will see how far they fell in and look up and be like, nah, I can't do it. That's impossible. No, you just, you just know it's going to take more effort than you want. I don't think we're ever trapped. Yeah. I've had 17 jobs. I've been fired 11 of them. Wow. <laughs> Always got another one. That yeah. was my mindset. I was like, yo, I got five. I'll get another one. Like, mm -hmm. That was always my mindset. So I don't think we're ever really trapped. It yeah. is what it is. Just, just do it. Just whatever you see, whatever you think you got to do, just do it. And you'll, you'll be all right.